class, uh, we, we rushed a bit through process monitoring, and I realized that, and I, I discovered that as well when I got emails from people asking questions, and I realized that it probably like, it was too fast, and uh, also the assumption that I had going into it was that you've seen some, most of you have seen process monitoring in the undergraduate course, but probably worth recapping a bit. And so I'm going to, I, I asked you to print out that separate page. Just go through that this page here and put process monitoring maybe just in perspective of, of why we're doing it. Um, look at the shortcomings of classical monitoring as a way to see how latent variable method monitoring has some advantages. Okay? And I don't have the screen now because I'm going to write here onto this map and that's why I asked you to print that page really big so that you can add your notes to it. Um, it's, it's not going to be formal notes, it's going to be uh, concepts. Because it's mostly just to recap the last time. So why do we why do we monitor? Well, the main reason why we monitor is we want stability. Okay, and by that it's I mean we want ideally as engineers what we really like is our processes to look like this, where this is say our set point, our target. Okay, and let's say it's density we're dealing with, and the number is about 1,600 and something. Ideally, we would like to produce product that is day in and day out. We're shipping to our customers product that's perfectly flat. They never see any variability. Our customers will love us, they will buy from us if we can deliver that to them. Okay? And that's a fair thing to say. If, you, if you're happy with the product you're buying from the grocery store or whoever, you're buying the product from, you usually just keep going unless there's some other reason. But the moment we start to see variability and things get bad, okay, so what happens then is we don't produce at that target. What we end up producing actually is there's the target line produce around that. Okay, so one day we might get a sample there, the next it's up here. We're moving all over around that target. Okay, and so the reason why we look at process monitoring is we say, well, how far away from that target is a reasonable distance, okay? And we, once we've discovered how far away is acceptable, we put control limits on it, lower and upper control limits. Okay, so this diagram was in the notes from last class, um, so, uh, somewhere near the end. I didn't get a chance to go through it, so you might want to add this to that. And so we put our lower control limits and our upper control limits. And we'll talk a bit about how those limits are calculated later on. But really, if we had, if we had this in our processes, even as engineers, we'd be super happy. Because this is saying we're on target plus or minus a certain range. And mostly, that can be approximated that's very bad, drawn, by a normal distribution. Okay? That noise can be approximated by a normal distribution. And that's, in fact, how we calculate that lower and upper control limit for a shoe on chart. We assume normality and we put those limits so that usually 99% of the variation falls within those bounds of the upper and lower control limits. Okay. Now a 99% control limit means 99% control limit implies 1% is outside under normal conditions. So if we're operating normally, up, we're producing good products, and I've got a 99% control limit, one sample out of 100, I'm going to create a false alarm. We discussed false alarms in last class. One point out of 100 is going to lie above that limit, even though that product then might be accessible. Okay? So that's usually how we, how we set these control limits. Is we, we set a certain false alarm rate that we are willing to accept Maybe, we're, maybe this is too high a false alarm. One time out of 100 might be too high for us, so we might use 99.5% instead. Or 99.9% is often a common. 99.9 with two nines means only one point out of 1,000 is generating a false alarm under normal, stable operating conditions. Okay, so we can deal with this. So this is Schuart charts, very easy to, to set. Find the target as your mean, your upper and your lower control limits you set as um, your false alarm rate. 
and you're done. But the problem is we don't have this. What we really see in practice is something more like this over here. Okay? Where we're operating at target and then the sensor maybe goes offline. The sensor comes back online a certain time later, but someone's maybe gone and replaced the unit in the process that's caused an upset, and it takes a while before we start getting back to target. So all of this period of, of time, we have to scrap that product. It's not to specification. Right? Because our, our upper and our lower control limits now lie here. There's my upper <coughs> control limit, there's my lower control limit. So all this product that's outside that upper control limit has to be thrown away, discarded, and it costs us money. Um, some companies will sell their bad product at discounted rate, but either way, you're not making money on that bad product. Um, then further down, other problems occur that cause drifts below the limit, and they take, take time. Here's a period of time where you're operating totally above the control limit. Again, you have to scrap all that product. So this is why we would like control charts in place. So we can detect these problems. Because our life, if everything was great, would be normally distributed. But the reality is we behave, the real process behaves much more like this. And actually, so during this period where the process was offline, we're really operating blind. We have no idea what, what things are doing. So at that period of time, you're taking a risk that everything is but you don't really know what's going on there. Okay. So, univariate control charts, let's just come back then to this, to this drawing and you can add to this. So, concepts we've looked at, there's the upper control limit, the lower control limit, the target, the problems. Problems with univariate control charts. Firstly, missing data. If we're just monitoring a single variable at a time and that goes offline, we can't do anything about it. Other problems, too many variables. Okay. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the other problem, correlation. If we're monitoring two variables that are extremely correlated, we're going to make type 1 errors much more frequently. And I used this illustration in the previous class to try and make that point over here. So here we've got two variables. Variable 1 is within its three sigma limits. Variable 2 is within its three sigma limits. But when I plot variable 1 against variable 2, most of the data follows this line over here. It's a negative correlation. But this point number 10 over here, that point 10 over there, maps to that position far away from that cluster of points which is otherwise got that negative correlation. So this particular point breaks the usual correlation. But we would never have detected this on two univariate control charts. Control chart for variable 1 and control chart for variable 2 don't show the problem, but jointly on a multivariate control chart, yes, we'll definitely see this problem we'll stick out so strongly on the on the square prediction error. So I guess I'm just trying to understand this completely. The inherent assumption here is that um, that correlation is a good thing and like a, a something that's necessary for the process to be operating normally. Well, let's take a look at the at the case where uh, the example I gave last class was. If you're producing a plastic product and you're at the end of your production line, you're measuring right. six to ten properties on it. You don't, you're not operating in six-dimensional space. Many of those variables are correlated with each other. So it's not necessarily a desirable or undesirable thing. It's just we measure redundant properties. Okay? And if you don't take that redundancy into account in your control chart monitoring, you're going to make a mistake. Okay? So too many variables. They're not independent. In other words, they're correlated. Missing data we can't deal with. Uh, there's another one here on my list. Diagnosis is a big problem. Um, so I'm going to tie that discussion of diagnosis with this concept of too many variables. And the way I'm going to look at that is by just discussing an extremely simple process. 
where we've got our raw materials coming in. So we're buying raw materials from some supplier. We feed that to unit A, which then processes it. Unit B processes some more. There's a feedback, uh, sorry, a recycle loop here. And we finish up the production and then we sell this to our customers. Very simple process. I mean, this flow sheet is, is, is trivial, but it, it highlights the problem with univariate monitoring. With univariate monitoring, we will spend our time monitoring variables where? Where would we monitor most critically in a flow sheet like that? Or the customer. Sorry. In a C? Yeah, are there a lot of Cs? You're going to monitor what's coming out of unit C. Okay. To make sure that you're shipping good product to your customer. But let's take a look at that. Let's, let's assume here coming out of unit C are 10 variables. <coughs> now, what if you've got, so you've got your 10 monitoring charts going in your, in your, on your dashboard. You've, train some operator whose job it is to monitor these 10 variables and they're supposed to spot problems and flag flag when, when something happens so that you can figure out what's causing that problem and then go and diagnose it. Okay. So very simple case, 10, 10 variables here and so the operator, let's say, sees this problem happening here. This variable starts to move down, this variable moves up, this variable moves up. And if that operator is extremely experienced, he or she may know right away, okay, this variable and that variable and that variable, when they behave in that pattern with that fingerprint, that's due to problem, problem A in unit B. Okay. But they're, they're using their knowledge of the process to figure that out. There might be a different signature in a different group of variables that will isolate problem X in, in a different unit and so on. So you can see how this is very much experience driven. Diagnosis from unit uh, from univariate monitoring charts very much relies on, on the operator knowing what is the signature of the pattern in the individual variables. Okay. Now there's a, there's a problem with that as well. If the operator is discovering this down here at unit C, you've already spent energy and time processing raw materials coming in at unit A and B. You're only detecting the problem in C, even though the problem might have occurred upstream in unit B. Okay. So let's say the, the delay from unit B to C is six hours, and the delay from unit A to B is four hours. You're picking up this problem in unit C. Now you're saying, well, six hours ago, that I, so you're detecting the problem in C six hours after it's occurred. But how much of this product do you scrap? And I, where do you even begin to decide, okay, what, what is the good period of operation? What was the bad period of operation in unit B? How much of that cascaded down to unit C? That would be okay because there's direct relationship between B and C. And if you've got good traceability in your process, you can go figure out, okay, if this problem occurred here at that time at 12 at, at noon, I can go back six hours and, and isolate that piece of, of product and not sell it to my customer. But let's say this problem was due to something in unit A, which is now cascaded into unit B. Then you've got this recycle stream sending it back into A, B, and C. Now it's much harder to try and figure out what is your bad material that you need to throw away. Okay. So the key issue here is one of time delay. If you can catch the problem in unit A or in unit B, then you can fix it right away and save energy and time before it reaches unit C, and then you only catch it later. That, is that concept clear? Yeah. So it's, it, the, the main issue for monitoring is to capture these and to try and save time and, and avoid loss of production. Okay. And we have 
this diagnosis issue here, which very much relies on an experienced operator to pick up the problems. So that's, that's the situation we, we typically face. And this would be on a very simple flow sheet. So the advantages then of a latent variable chart would be to monitor every single unit. So you try to monitor every unit. Because what if we are? And the reason why you can do that now is because you don't have correlated variables. Your scores, your T1, your T2 scores that you create when you build the monitoring chart on the upstream units are, are uncorrelated, so you don't have correlation. You can handle missing data. And you end up having fewer variables to monitor. You only have T1, T2, T3 now, and you have T squared, and you have SPE. So you've reduced your problem for monitoring many variables. Let's say unit A has 50 variables. You've reduced that now to monitoring, let's say A in this particular unit happens to be four plus SPE plus T squared. So you're now monitoring just six variables. And you can, in fact, um, and I'll show in the, in the example later on from the FASCO, we can really just get away with monitoring SPE and T squared. Because SPE monitors the distance off the plane, T squared monitors the distance on the plane. And when those go out of control, then you can go back and look at the scores. Yes, it's real time. Real-time because your loadings are fixed once you've built your monitoring model I'll talk about that here in, in a second so you can bring it you can do this in real time and the example we'll look at is, is real time from the task okay so usually what people go and do here let's just go back to the classical case there's too many variables so what do they go do is They subsample, oh, sorry, not subsample, they just select, selectively monitor. Okay. So they monitor fewer variables. They say, well, I, this is too overwhelming for me to go monitor 50 variables from this unit. I'm going to pick and choose five or six variables that I believe are critical. And most of the times they're they're going to be okay. They're going to get by with those five or six variables because they've used their engineering judgment to pick a handful of variables which are not correlated. Okay, no one in there, if you as an engineer had to go pick five variables from this unit, you're going to pick the five variables that kind of are independent and give you new pieces of information. You're not going to monitor two temperatures from the same unit because all those two temperatures are just going to move up and down together. So you wouldn't select those two temperatures, you select one temperature and one pressure, one flow rate. You go use your knowledge of the process to select these variables in a smart way. Uh, that gets you by uh, around the correlation. <coughs> Diagnosis might still be doable with those handful of variables, but the problem is when you see on your monitoring chart, let's say you pick temperature now to monitor. <coughs> You might go see temperature behaving like this and then going out of control, you'd say, well, to try and diagnose this problem, you have to go back to some of the other variables anyway. Okay. So, so that's, the, that's the usual approach for, for process monitoring from the classical approach. But the latent variable approach, we can do much better by using all our data and calculating the scores. T squared and SPE and just monitoring those. 
Now, when it comes to building a latent variable chart, this is the part I just want to quickly talk about and then we'll look at the assignment because uh, uh, from the questions I had, I think this is something that we're so only got stuck. So the ideal case for building a latent variable model is as follows. Select only good data. So you pick a period, you pick periods of time in your process operation where you are operating well, where you sold that product to your customer eventually. You don't you do not include outliers or, or problematic behavior or periods of time when you knew there were process upsets. Okay. So you build your model only on good data. That PCA model captures the correlations then between the variables under good operation. That's the key point for later variable out of the PCA monitor. So select only good data, build PCA model, and then you use testing data. And that testing data contains both good and bad observations. bad periods of operation should be represented in that testing data. Once you have that, you can put that, put that testing data through the PCA model, and the PCA model should detect and pick up the bad operation, should show up above T squared, and or SP. Okay. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, the difference between the two. And the good data should show up always below, or always inside the limits. Okay, so last class we spoke a bit of how the software calculates those limits. The good periods of operation should always fall within those limits. This is just the detection part. Okay. That's this step over here. Detecting. You detect a problem when it shows up outside the limits on the scores, outside the limits on T squared or outside the SPD. But that's not that's not the end all of, of process monitoring. Process monitoring we want to detect, then we want to diagnose, and then we want to fix the problem. Okay. So detection is only the first prerequisite step. Diagnosis then is via SPE, uh, sorry, via the contribution plus. Outside the limits. Let's take a look at SPE. Let's say. So here's time, and you're operating, and you start to see it trend up. The moment you're above that limit, you highlight the point in the software, or the op or can automatically be done, and you generate the contribution plot. So you go from your SPE, you see the alarm. So that's your detection step. Next step is diagnosis. And that's done by the contribution plot. So this is uh, contributions. 
And so you'd say, well, this variable over here with the large bars it reduces down your problem space from many variables down to just these fewer variables. That's the diagnosis. So this is step one, step two, and then step three is to uh, fix fix the problem. And that that's really dependent on the process itself, how you how you do that. So for every for every system that you're monitoring, this step would be slightly different. So that's the, that's the general philosophy of, of process monitoring. To detect with your school plots, detect with your SPEs, detect with your hotel and T-squared, then you diagnose and then you make some sort of corrective action, take some sort of corrective action. And the other key advantage of latent variable monitoring is that you can get what I would call good fault signatures. So what do I mean by a good fault signature? Let's take a look back at this case study over here with, uh, with a simple process. So, a good fault signature is as follows. Here we've got our 10 variables and we're measuring them on our output. And let's say we're measuring these once per hour. So 10 variables, you're measuring your final quality product, usually at a much lower rate than, than any of your upstream. You usually don't, me because these, these downstream variables are often measured in the lab, they're the many times they're not available in real time from your process. And when a problem occurs, you're seeing the fault, you're seeing the problem in one of the 10 variables. Your question is now, where, where was it? Was it due to operation unit C, B, or A, or some combination of events? Or it might have been even due to your raw materials that you got from your supplier that that problem propagated through, through the process. Okay. So, if you look at those 10 variables, you can, you can, you can see then, well, let's say variable one has a very small contribution. Um, or in other words, variable one, if you looked at its monitoring chart univerically, would still be within the control limits. Variable two might show up as being big, and variable three might show up as being big. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten really show no, no extra contribution. So if you see the problem showing up, either univerically or multivariately, it wouldn't really matter. In variables two and three, and six and uh, sorry, seven, ten, and eight, and seven, seven and eight. So you see that problem occur over there. Now, what I mean by good fault signatures are, when you see this in, in these four variables, there's a number of ways you can get that problem in those variables from the upstream, okay? The upstream process can operate in many different ways in order to get the similar faults showing up near the end. There's a non-unique relationship. There might be a unique way. You might say, well, when a two is high, three is low, seven and eight are high, I know it's always that problem. But there's no guarantee that's the case. Okay. Especially if, let's say, you only see variable two high and all the others show normal behavior. There's an infinite number of ways you can get that variable high in, in most processes. If you get more than one variable showing up, that usually narrows the search down or narrows the, the scope of what could have been the cause of this problem, narrows that scope down. Single variables or two variables showing up, that's a much harder problem to detect and try and identify exactly why. Okay, and the reason why I'm going on about this identification part and, and, and detecting why the fault occurred is because we have to do step three. 
we have to eventually go and fix the problem, and we don't want to be fixing the wrong problem. <laughs> so it's very important to be able to unambiguously identify the cause of your of your fault. Okay. Whereas if you have real time monitoring here, so here you've got real time monitoring in A and real time monitoring in B, you can much much quicker at a higher frequency than that. Because now you're getting the data in real time from your database once every minute, once every five seconds, whatever the case might be. And you can pick up the problem right away on the very specific variables because you're monitoring all these variables multivariately. You can very quickly pick up the, the problem here from the upstream part. Firstly, you're going to pick it up earlier than waiting for it to hit unit C. And secondly, you're going to pick up the problem unambiguously. Okay, so those are the two key advantages of multivariate monitoring. It's faster detection times, that you can do it in real time, and, and a third one would, would be that you can usually unambiguously identify the fault and the reason for it. I can talk about that. I'm going to look at a few case studies. Uh, I'm going to first go through uh, just another quick concept, then we'll look at the assignments, and then I'll, I'll present some case studies of process monitoring, and we'll talk about different ways of, of building monitoring models. Okay. <coughs> okay, anything else on that? Yeah, I remember the last class you said that actually we're going to the SB and it has a high T square, we can argue that it's not an outlier and then we can build up more. Right. Okay, so one of, so uh, Yas was asking that, what ha oh, I, and, I, and you're, thanks for reminding me, I'd forgotten to talk about the different combinations. So you can, let's, let's, in one of the examples I'll show you in a minute, the only monitoring charts used are T squared and SPE. So let's take a look at all the combinations you can possibly have. So T squared and SPE, you can have four, four possible combinations. T squared is below, SPE is below. And this is, that's what you want. Okay? You always want your T squared and your SPE to be below the limits. T squared can be above, while SPE can be below. T squared can be below its limit and SPE above or both above. And the case where T squared is above its limit but SP is below its limit, the, the visual picture you have in your mind there is of a point that's on the plane or close to the plane, so it's well within the SPE limits. So SPE defines the distance of the point off the plane. So the fact that it's below its SPE limit says within the normal region of operation, this data point lies within the typical space of the model. So in other words, the model works well for this data point. This data point is well explained by the model. It doesn't have a high residual error, which is what SPE captures, is the residual error. So its residual error is low, it's well explained by the model, but T squared is high, which means the point is far away from the model center, which would mean that the X's, because you take your X values, multiply them by the loadings to get your T's, so T is equal to X times P. The P's are fixed, so the only way you can get a high T value is by having your X's high. So it just indicates that this point has got x values that are either much higher or much lower than the normal mean from your mean after your mean centric. 
but those points are not so high and not so low to cause the prediction from the model to be bad. The model's prediction is still good, the SP is low. So that point is on the plane, but just a bit towards the edge of the plane. One way of this occurring is when you build your model on good data, up here, so you build your model on good data, let's say now in the future, your boss decides to increase the throughput of the process. So you want to go from, instead of producing at 100 kilograms an hour, you want to move to 110 kilograms an hour. Still producing the same product. You can imagine then that as you ramp up your throughput, you may be increase your, you have to increase your flow rate through the process. You may have to increase the temperature slightly. You may have to pull back on some other variables. So everything changes, but it's just a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller than it might have been before. So that's a point that would get you high T squared. Because it's now everything is still in sync, it's still coherent, the correlation structure is still the same, but it's just a little bit more or less than it was before. Does that make sense? That explanation? Yeah. So, so you actually should keep that point, right? You be able to be well, you could argue either way. That's why I said it, it, you could say some cases, yeah, it shouldn't be there because the idea is that you built your model on good data, okay? So if that point is high T squared, but it's still good, it's arguing that you may have to rebuild your model with that data point included so that now your control limits for T squared get a little bit bigger and capture that period. Okay, and because we're, we're looking at a sign for doing that, because, I mean, if I said that this point is an outlier, then I know this, wouldn't that shrink my limits and then this would cause me like five point errors like in, for, for any new data? No, it depends by how much it, it, it changes the model. So it, you can definitely, you'll have to go and look at that afterwards. That's why I say it's good to have a testing data set that you know there's good data and bad data. You go, after you rebuild your model, you run that testing data set through and you make sure the bad points are still detected as bad and the good points are still detected as good. So you still get the same level of type one and type two error. Yeah. I'm not sure if this looks very clear or not. So, but uh, is it like the T squared is really measuring whether the individual variables are, well it's not really individual variables, but the variables in general are staying within their control limits. And SP is measuring whether the model is still valid? That's right. That, yeah. that is right. So if you're looking back to the traditional control chart, that's more represented by T squared? Traditional SP is sort of a new thing? Well, also, uh, control, <laughs> the univariate control charts are not able to pick up whether the relationship between right, them is still sure, because it's just monitoring right. each variable without any consideration of the other variables. But well, that's basically, that, so like a, an error that you would catch on the univariate control chart should more show likely be in the T-squared category than that. That's right, that's a good way to see it, yeah. There was a question back there. No, it's still small. Yeah. Okay. So this part is critical. When you build your monitoring model, you should keep the testing data set aside to put through as new data and verify your type 1 and your type 2 error. Okay. And last class I said that you can never get both a low type 1 and a low type 2 error. There's no free lunch here, okay? And a very easy way to see why that's the case is as follows. If you have, let's say we're, we're monitoring T1, okay? Here's our upper control limit and the lower control limit. The type 1 error is, is what? Yeah, how would you describe the type 1 error on a T on a score plot? Uh, type 1 error is a, a what type of error? Yeah. Alarm, okay. So the false alarm would say I'm reading a point that's outside the limit, but it's actually from good operation. Okay. So how would you and let's say you're getting a lot of these. So you're getting a lot of points outside these limits. You're also getting your points inside, hopefully. But your operators come back to you and say, you know, Jake, this monitoring chart you built me sucks. It's always throwing up type of one alarms. What can you do about it? So what can you do about it? What is it? Uh, 
Okay, but what would, what would change? Okay, because your, your mean for T1 is all at zero. Okay, so what would change on your monitoring chart? So the limits would change. Okay. So if you go to reduce the type 1 error, it means your limits must go up. So you rebuild your model and your limits will become wider. Okay. So you've reduced your type 1 error. Now your operators are happy because these points that were false alarms are now not false alarms anymore. But what happened to your type 2 error? Things are out there. Type 2 error has gone up because what's a type 2 error? Type 2 is a false positive, or it's when you really should have raised an alarm, but you don't. Sorry, so that's a bad one. It should be here. <coughs> so there's your point. You, that point really is out of control. You should have raised an alarm, but you didn't because you've now increased your limits so much that that point is now inside the limits. Okay, maybe this is going a little bit beyond where we are now, but if, uh, so one of the advantages I can see that if you have the classical, just to play that with a couple of times for a second here, so the classical monitoring system, variables in uh, C, you're much more happy making uh, type 1 um, errors in, in variables in the C reactor than you are in the A reactor, right? A reactor, you want type 1 to be very low, because it's not going to matter as much, like, I mean, I'm thinking. I don't know. So I, what I'm saying is, there, is there some way with this? Like, if you, because you don't really have any big control over how sensitive you are to variation in any one of the given variables. So let's say I, I, you know, just my engineering knowledge, I want to be more sensitive to um, errors in C than I am in A. Yeah. Is there a way to adjust for that? You think? Well, you can build separate monitoring charts for A and C. Okay. So you have your school monitoring charts for A and you set the ones for C. Yeah, because that allow you to set set these. They're monitoring different things as well. We'll talk, in fact, later on in the course about building multi-block models yeah. where you build a, a single monitoring chart for the whole process, but within that monitoring chart, you've got other monitoring sections for A, B, and C. I guess, I guess kind of what I was thinking about is what would happen if you didn't scale the unit variance is that actually increase the amount of variance that, like, deliberately, like, so, yeah, you're, you're, you're bringing up a topic we will definitely cover. So Brandon's asking, if you wanted to make the monitoring chart more sensitive to a particular variable, you're absolutely right. You can just go scale that variable up. You don't have to scale it to unit variance. You can maybe go scale it to twice unit variance, make it twice as important. So the model focuses more heavily on that variable. That is, that is valid. That's absolutely that is valid. valid. Yeah, absolutely valid. Anything that you can do to make bad data being picked up as bad and good data being picked up as good is fair game. You want to minimize your type 1 error, you want to minimize your type 2 error, but as we've shown here, you can never have both. You, there's always a trade-off. You can never, ever get absolutely both under the limits. You always have one or the other, or you're hoping for some middle ground where you're, you're not raising too many type 1 or type 2 errors. So how about on your T squared? Is it impossible to set a different limit on T1? You can change your limits arbitrarily. So in the notes I've written there, there's absolutely no reason why you have to use 99% limits. If you want to move this higher and lower arbitrarily, you can. And you can use 99% limits here on the scores, but 95% limits on the SPE. Okay. Because SPE is going to pick up when things get out of sync. You might want to pick that up really early and you're willing to take a few false alarms. But you may not want this case here. So absolutely anything that will pick up your, your errors, you can anything you can do to your model, adjusting the limits, adjusting the pre-processing to get that sensitivity is big.